Good afternoon. My name is Kevan Nejarian. Um, uh, I am with Department of Computation and Medicine and Bioinformatics, uh, Department of Emergency Medicine, Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan. Uh, I am working with uh, uh, two centers, Michigan Institute for Data Science at University of Michigan, also Center for Integrative Research in Critical Care. Uh, um, the title of the discussion today would be on uh, future of artificial intelligence in medicine and healthcare, uh, focusing on fears and hopes. Uh, speaking of fears, this is the first time I'm doing a, a webinar like that, so I hope I check all the technical things, hoping that everything works fine, but uh, please, through the chat, let me know if, if, if you have any um, uh, concerns or if, if anything is not working. So uh, we're going to start by uh, acknowledging the sponsors of the research that I will be presenting. And I thank our sponsors for uh, funding the research that presented here. I'm going to start uh, by introducing the people in my lab who are the actual people who are doing this research and I'm presenting their works basically. Our lab has a number of faculty, faculty associated with them and uh, we have uh, people from uh, the technical side of this, uh, mathematicians, um, engineers, and also clinicians from different backgrounds who are essentially leading these projects. Um, our lab has a research manager uh, and uh, Dr. Jonathan Greik, and we also have uh, research faculty, Dr. Surushmer, who's leading the efforts, and we have a number of uh, postdoctoral fellows. And these are the graduate students, the people who actually conduct the research in, in the lab, the PhD students. Uh, some of them are uh, PhD students, some of them MD PhD students, and we also have um, a number of uh, very talented, smart undergraduate students who are contributing to the research in the lab. So I'm going to start by talking of uh, the fears in using AI in, in medicine. Um, many, so I'm going to uh, outline some of the issues and we get back to them and discuss them later on in a different format. Uh, first issue is that if you look at solutions designed for medicine based on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you realize that majority of what they have developed in, in literature stays as publications. They don't go uh, beyond publications. They, you know, people cite them, people, you know, discuss them, but in reality, they don't turn into a com commercial product, a real product that can help um, uh, improve the quality of care provided to the patients. And out of the ones that uh, envision as a product and designed to help with, with medicine, they fail to pass uh, regular clinical trials and never make it to the market. And the uh, out of the ones that make it to the market uh, or they're getting towards becoming a commercial product, some of them, they're not FDA approved. They fail to be you know, uh, FDA approved. And out of the ones that pass FDA approval, uh, the few products that are truly using machine learning and artificial intelligence, they get the FDA approval, but they're not widely used by the community. So the impact of this product is very limited. And that's like in an observation that you see in many uh, publications, in many you know, discussions that people have in the field, many panels this bring that up. up. And all of these issues um, are somehow fueled by a type of hype over uh, artificial intelligence, and in particular when applied to medicine, and perhaps unreasonable expectations that you know, people have uh, in, in terms of what AI can do in medicine. And there is a fear that if we continue having these expectations, and not addressing the existing issues one by one, we may head into uh, another AI winter, and this time mostly in medicine and biology, because all those expectations may not you know, fulfill and people feel that may perhaps like the problem is with AI. 
So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to show you a challenge tree, the major challenges and opportunities that exist when we talk about using AI and machine learning in, in healthcare. And I address some of those challenges in, in more detail later on. So as you see, the challenge tree has three types of uh, issues involved in it, three types of challenges. Technical challenges, health and clinical challenges, and cultural and policy-related challenges. This one, the uh, uh, socioeconomic and, and cultural challenges, I'm not going to focus too much on those, but you can guess that there is a whole lot of you know, concerns about uh, how the regulatory and incentive uh, methods and the policies that are uh, put in place can affect the use of AI. Um, so what happens if, if you know, AI um, recommends for certain things in medicine and that uh, course of action, that medication, that treatment results in a in, in, in negative outcome for the patient? Uh, according to the legal system, it's not clear who exactly gets, you know, uh, sued for that or who's responsible for, for that, who's the liable entity in it. Is the uh, clinician that used that? Is the company that created the, the, the product? Is the hospital system that acquired the, the product? There's a spectrum of legal and, and you know, policy-related issues that are not very clear. And I see that, you know, uh, in at least a couple of cases in the past, uh, since the, the policy on these aspects were not clear, that caused sort of, you know, uh, an, an issue for, for commercialization, through commercialization or the usage of these products. What I'm going to focus mainly in here is the technical challenges. Some of them are uh, data related, some of the algorithmic related challenges, which I will talk about them next. But I also uh, refer to some of the uh, clinical issues and technical issues in terms of the health such as epistemic issues in terms of who defines these, these uh, diseases, what is the exact definition of the diseases that we, we're trying to address with AI. For instance, what is the exact definition of sepsis? So if you want to create a, a computed aided support system to address sepsis, first you have to have a very clear definition of what sepsis is. And lack of uh, clear clinical definitions can cause issues for the AI, then the AI is not essentially responsible for that. So let's focus on uh, uh, data-related challenges um, in, in, in terms of um, uh, AI in medicine. First thing is you have to uh, consider the fact that uh, there is a lot of variability and there is there are a lot of different structures to the data used in, in clinical uh, decision support and medicine. For instance, you have all kinds of images that have specific structure, videos that have structure, and you have data in electronic health record, each one of them having different, uh, different sort of format. And not just that, in medicine, the input data that you use, the attributes that you use as the input, they're often extremely noisy. Like you have a lot of missing data, you have a lot of uh, noisy attributes that their measurements is not quite certain. More importantly, the labels that they're, use, they're using in medicine uh, are also not very certain. As an example, the issue of sepsis that I discussed before, if you're designing classification technique to predict the occurrence of sepsis uh, or even detect the presence of sepsis, first you need to know exactly what sepsis is, and there is clear lack of, you know, uh, clarity and, 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 and exact definition of things like sepsis, ARDS, and other things. The other thing is the issue of completeness of the data. A patient may go to different healthcare systems for the same disease, like first they go to the uh, urgent care close to their house, they get some tests done, and then they go to a hospital, then they go to another hospital, for the same disease, for the same condition, for the same issue, they may go to different places and none of these databases are truly connected with each other. And even within a hospital, within one healthcare system, some of the data that we need may be stored in a completely different database. For example, it's on the images are on the packs and clinical data is on 
electronic health health uh, record systems like you know Cerner or, or Epic, and there are uh, a bunch of data that are you know sort of collected locally within the you know the 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 unit that is that is running the test and they're never shared or, or um, essentially distributed through these any of these databases. So completeness of the data is another issue. Another thing is data security and privacy and data sharing. Because of all the concerns that different healthcare systems has about have about the privacy of the uh, uh, data, having personal health information, PHI data in there, uh, often they uh, cannot share data with others and they have to anonymize the data and some of these uh, anonymization will somehow remove the information that might be helpful for clinical decision support system. Or on the other hand, may, they may not remove some of the, you know, some of the data that they're not considered as PHI, but combination of these can uh, essentially be um, a risk for privacy and security of, 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 the, of the data. So there are concerns about that. And because of these concerns over data sharing, we, um, we have the issue of not having enough large databases, large and comprehensive databases. So in any other things in machine learning and artificial intelligence, the quality of the model that you develop to the most part depends on the comprehensiveness and the size of the database that you're using. And these issues that I mentioned would prevent creating the databases that you can actually use to create a reliable uh, model. Then algorithmic side, most of our talk would be focusing on the algorithmic challenges. Algorithmic challenges, the first one that I can uh, mention here is the need to customize a uh, machine learning algorithm to match any specific application that we are processing. Uh, one observation that anybody can make is that recently, and, and uh, more specifically in medicine, people have been uh, using one-size-fits-all kind of approach in machine learning. For example, they have this deep learning method that regardless of what exact problem they're addressing, they put the data in this machine and they shake it and they, they expect to have a model that would be suitable for that specific application, which essentially is not very realistic uh, expectation. In reality, every, uh, every application, every domain requires a particular type of model that matches the reality of that, that, that problem, that, that application. And the tendency to use the same machine learning for everything has created you know, some results that are uh, not reproducible and some models that are not robust enough. So it's highly desirable to look at the realities of uh, medical applications and see if we can generate algorithms that match those specific applications. Uh, second problem is that in medicine, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, majority of the databases are, are extremely sparse. In other words, like, you know, you, you do have a bunch of variables for which you don't have a lot of instances. You have some uh, examples, but in, if you look at the uh, data as a comprehensive, like, you know, uh, um, entity, there are so many missing data points in it, and that uh, causes an issue for training neural network or any other machine learning algorithm, in particular neural networks. And in order to address that, we feel that there should be approaches in machine learning that allow the domain knowledge, what else we, uh, is known about the application to help address this sparsity. I'm going to leave it vague at that level, and I get back to it when I talk about you know, uh, some potential approaches to that. And another factor is, uh, if you look at what people publish in the field, first thing that uh, some, uh, especially like, you know, statisticians and people with uh, more mathematical approach to the problems they, they, they see is the fact that some of these models are not properly validated and assessed. Uh, they use a certain small amount of data to train a very large model 
and then the assessment is is not comprehensive enough to actually show that the model is not doing overfitting many of these methods are not uh, are not reproducible in the sense that they created with the data that is either too small that has the flavor of one particular healthcare system and when tested in larger databases on other databases on other healthcare system data they completely fail and this is because uh, poor validation methods that are used for majority of these machine learning algorithms. And last item is uh, is the challenge that is is becoming more and more uh, uh, evident in in medical field, and that's um, uh, lack of you know ability in terms of like these machine learning algorithms to address the structure and the temporal relation of the data. It's in order to see how important the structure is, imagine that if I show you a structure, two-dimensional structured data, we call it an image. If I show you an image and I ask you what you see in that image, let's say there's a like, you know, image of a person, you will immediately just by looking at the two-dimensional entity, you know that uh, this is a person, a person that you know, perhaps. But if I get the same data, I get the same image, and I flatten the data, I make a big vector out of that, like concatenate all the rows one after another, ending up with a large vector. I haven't changed the pixel values, I haven't changed the information in any of like individual pixels. But by making a very, very long vector, as opposed to the structure, two-dimensional structure, if I show you this long vector and I ask you, what is it that I'm showing in this image? You cannot say that. And it's because, because of the fact that the most important information in that image was the 2D structure. And by flattening the data, you're actually destroying the main uh, information in the, in the data. And if you look at majority of these algorithms, uh, these algorithms are actually doing nothing but that. They get the, the information, flatten the information, then we'll try to figure out what was uh, the object that they process. And that's an issue that was recognized by the community and, and now there are methods like deep learning is trying to in, in some way address that. There are other techniques that are doing the same, uh, the same task. So I talked about all these uh, issues and fears and challenges. I think it's now, uh, it's a good time to talk about some of the hopes, some of the good things that are happening. One thing is that FDA and other regulatory uh, authorities, I think they're, they're improving their guidelines. They're becoming more aware of what an AI-based product is. And, and they're trying to come up with better way of testing and validating these things there's some of the regulations that they have, they're still very old and outdated, but I think there's a trend to better understand where AI stands, machine learning and artificial intelligence stand, and how to uh, uh, test them in a clinical setting. The other thing, uh, there are so many consortia that are dealing with uh, creating larger databases, even though they're not as comprehensive as you want them to be, but there's still, there's so many, you know, there, there are so many efforts, uh, uh, national and, and international efforts that are trying to uh, create larger databases that are more useful for AI and, and machine learning. Uh, the other thing is, I would say that some uh, components, some parts of the uh, medical uh, community, they are becoming more reasonable with their expectations from AI. They're not expecting magic from AI. They don't expect a box that can always tell them what they want to hear. And algorithms are also improving and addressing uh, some of these challenges. So from now on, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna focus on, on how to address some of these uh, challenges. I would love to just focus on the overall uh, methods of addressing these challenges and, and don't talk about our own research, but in reality, I know uh, the solutions that I'm using better than others. So what I'm trying to do is talk about these challenges and give you an example of a solution that we have developed in our lab. So the first challenge is systematic integration of uh, auxiliary information that we have uh, around around the subject. Remember, I um, 
uh, I mentioned that when the data is very sparse, in order to have better uh, machine learning or better modeling of the problem, you have to use what else is available uh, in, in, in the domain. You have to use the domain knowledge. You have to look at other data that can somehow affect your ability to address this uh, and to model this sparse data. This particular example that I'm going to talk about is an algebraic approach to drug repositioning and drug repurposing that we have, um, you know, started working on, and it, it seems uh, uh, to be doing exactly what, what we wanted to do in terms of integration of auxiliary uh, information. So just a quick uh, couple of definitions. Drug repositioning is um, uh, usage of an already used drug for one purpose, for another purpose. For example, uh, a PROSCAR that I mentioned in here was originally developed for uh, prostate cancer, and now people are using that for um, some sort of male pattern baldness as well. So the drug was used for some purpose. Now you're seeing that if you can use it for another purpose as well. And drug repositioning is the case that there is a, a drug that has failed for a certain application, and now you're asking yourself, can we use it for another purpose, for another application? So this is a huge sort of uh, uh, effort and, and, and direction in, in uh, pharmaceutical research, and we're trying to somehow use algebraic method to help with that. So if you look at what, why we need like algebraic and computational method towards that, you have to think about that the fact that typically they have a few thousand, if not a few tens of thousands of uh, uh, small molecules that they use for the drugs, and they have uh, uh, a few thousand, if not tens of thousands of, of uh, potential targets that could be, you know, uh, proteins, could be genes, could be uh, other factors. So we have a whole lot of, you know, if you think of a matrix of drug versus target, we have a uh, high dimensional matrix, but this matrix is highly, highly uh, sparse in a sense that one drug was tested against one or a few uh, targets, and you don't know anything about the interaction between the, 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 this drug and other potential targets. So you are dealing with a sparseness of sometimes around 99.997%. So there are very few uh, uh, known numbers in there, whether it's zero saying that there is no interaction, or there is one that's saying there is an interaction, and the rest of the numbers in there, the rest of 99.997% are just unknown, so you don't know. So if you think of this problem in terms of mathematical formulation, it's nothing but matrix completion in the sense that you have a matrix of drug versus targets, but we have very few numbers in there. You want to somehow use uh, what you know to complete this matrix and estimate the interaction, potential, potential interaction between uh, drugs and, and other, other proteins. So various techniques have been designed to address that. Some of them are based on uh, similarity-based methods. Some of them, you know, they're based on um, um, other techniques in machine learning, such as deep learning, and some of them are, are using algebraic methods like uh, matrix factorization. What we want to do, we want to go back to our uh, policy and, and our understanding that there is a whole lot of, you know, side information around this matrix that can help us complete this more intelligently and have a more reliable model. First approach is something we call it coupled matrix matrix completion. Uh, so this is the matrix that we want to uh, complete. This is the drug versus target. But in reality, we know a whole lot about the interaction between the drugs. For example, we look at the 3D structure of these drugs, and we can say how similar the structure of the, these molecules are to each other. So that's some information. There is another information that deals with targets, the relationship between the targets. We have protein-protein interaction matrices that, you know, very quantitatively tell us uh, uh, how these proteins interact with each other. So this is information, auxiliary information, 
that is highly valuable. This is also auxiliary information is highly valuable. The question is, can we use these additional matrices, MXX and MIY, in order to help complete MXY? So that's one thing that we started working on. There are others who are doing that, but we, uh, with the help of uh, uh, Dr. Harm Dexon, who's a, a well-known uh, algebraic, uh, a theoretical algebraic uh, mathematician, we came up with an approach that systematically uses the information in, 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 in these two auxiliary matrices to better complete this uh, drug target um, um, uh, interaction matrix. But not just that. Keep in mind that if you want to look at the interaction between the drugs, between these uh, small molecules, there is no just one way of looking at it. For example, you can look at the interaction of these molecules in different pH environments. You can look at this from, uh, there are different, different simulators, different models to show the 3D structure similarities. There are all kinds of other ways of uh, looking at similarity of uh, drugs to drugs. So there is, in reality, that we have multiple uh, matrices like that. Same thing with targets. You can look at the interaction between the targets in many different ways. And as a result, we are dealing with uh, another problem, a more comprehensive problem called coupled tensor matrix completion. In, in other words, you want to, again, you want to complete this matrix. That's your target matrix but you have two tensors, a stack of matrices that identify drug-drug interaction and a stack of matrices that identify target-target interaction. So you have a tensor of the targets, tensor of the, of the drugs, and you want to use these known values, these values, a structured data within these two tensors to complete this uh, unknown matrix that uh, is very sparse. So, I'm not going to go over the details of the algorithm, but this algorithm systematically considers what is known as the interaction between the, the, the matrices of, of the drug-drug interaction and target-target interaction, and the same thing with the tensor to have a better estimation of uh, uh, drug-target interaction. So the question is, let's we develop such a model, how we test it, how we validate it. In order to validate it, in, we repeat this as a, a process that I will describe a hundred times or like a thousand times, doesn't matter. What we do each time, we go and remove 10% of the uh, data that we know that are there, right? The, the known information. We pretend that we don't know that and we use the rest of the 90% remaining to estimate the ones that we have removed. And we keep doing that for 100 times, so each time randomly remove 10%. And our ability to predict what we have already removed intentionally tells us whether the algorithm can guess what, what uh, might be the values, other values in the matrix and complete the matrix for us. So without going into the details, I'm gonna show you one uh, set of results that we have. We have done multiple databases uh, of, of uh, uh, drug interactions. Um, these are all the techniques that, you know, majority of the techniques people are using in the field, and this is um, a coupled matrix matrix uh, completion method, which you see that in terms of AUC, in terms of the computational time, in terms of accuracy, and in terms of the standard deviation over all of these factors is superior to all that, but when you get to um, coupled tensor matrix completion, then we have substantially better results compared to all of these techniques and and uh, all across all the measures, like, you know, if you look at F, F1 score is significantly higher than the rest of them. So we have tested that on multiple databases, like drug, drug, drug bank is, you know, one of the large publicly available databases we have used other uh, databases and they all like you know get you something around uh, 15 to 20 percent improvement in AUC just by using auxiliary information in a systematic structured way. So that's one of the challenges. The next challenge that I'm talking about it would be creating generalized yet robust models that can be trained by small databases. Um, keep in mind that we have you know techniques that 
can be very you know uh, robust, but you need substantial amount of data to train them. Uh, can we have models that can be tra trained with small uh, data sets, but will be robust and, and repeatable and generalizable? For that, I'm going to talk about uh, one uh, example that we have developed in our lab, an algorithm that we developed for detection of in-vehicle cardiac uh, uh, events uh, funded by Toyota. And we want to, for that, we want to uh, essentially detect uh, some severe types of arrhythmia, like severe atrial fibrillation, AFib, uh, supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, ventricular arrhythmia, VA, and uh, bradycardia, BC. So what we want to do, and we look at other types of like very, you know, more, uh, less, less common types of arrhythmia as well. Majority of the techniques that are out there, they have, you know, they look at the electrocardiogram and they try to first detect where the major peaks and major features of the signal are. For example, they do R detection, P, Q, R, S, T detection, and based on the timing between these, and, and the duration of some segments, such as ST segment, they come up with, uh, with, with some algorithm. One major issue with these algorithms is the fact that in some of these, like arrhythmia that are listed in here, like AFib and others, in some of these arrhythmias, you don't have some of these things. Like you, you, it's very rare that you can ever uh, see U and uh, U wave, and, and sometimes, uh, most of the time, you don't see T, and P is also missing in some of them. So even the existence of some of these waves is questionable, let alone like, you know, you count on these as features in order to, to assess the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, arrhythmia. For instance, if you if you rely too much on ST segmentation for your decision making, and ST cannot be computed because T is not very visible, it's mixed with noise, then you have a lot of inaccuracies just because of that assumption. So these are, if you look at two groups of algorithms used for this, the first group of algorithms that I'm going to talk about here are the algorithms that are combination of conventional uh, signal processing and image processing techniques. These techniques essentially try to pre-process the data, do the peak detection, as I said, find where R, P, Q, R, S, T are, do some feature extraction with, you know, methodologies such as wavelet or HRV techniques, and do feature reduction with PCA, ICA, other methods, and then feed this feature to some algorithm, random forest, support vector machine, artificial neural network to come up with the prediction, even uh, Markov models on the features. That's the more conventional approach to this problem. But another uh, group of uh, methods are using deep learning, which is very different from those. They just feed the ECG directly to the model, to the, to the deep learning uh, technique, and then get, get the prediction. There are good things and bad things about both of them, like I said, the issue with this approach is that, you know, everything, the conventional approach depends on your ability to get these features and name them, make sure that this is actually R, it's not a different peak. And the issue with deep learning is that, you know, deep learning is works fine, relatively fine, if you have an enormous amount of data. For some of these, like SVT, if you look, if you put all the reported SVTs, assuming that the quality of the, the annotation is very high, there would be, there is no big database on, on SVT. It would be very difficult to create enough cases so that like a deep learning algorithm can reliably uh, and robustly predict SVT. I'm going to show that through some uh, results. First, I'm going to quickly uh, introduce our algorithm. Our algorithm is very simple. It's a probabilistic sort of uh, version of a finite automata system. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, is some automated uh, version of a Markov model. What it does starts with soft uh, symbolization. Uh, let's assume we're not doing soft, we're doing hard symbolization. This is what we do. We put some levels, A, B, and C. We don't care about the, the waves like R or whatever. We just like divide the, um, the range of the values in normalized ECG as A, B, and C and we change the sequence of numeric data in sequence of 
uh, alphabetic data. For example, if you look at all these regions, it's B. So you have B, 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 then you go to C, you get a bunch of Cs, then you go back to B, you get an one B, and then you go to A, you get a couple of A's, you go back to C and B, and again a bunch of Cs. So instead of relying on, on the exact numeric value, you create a, a long uh, uh, string of, of uh, variables. Like I said, this is the uh, hard version of symbolization. We're doing a soft symbolization. In other words, we create a probability of each thing being A or B or C. So instead of like saying it's definitely it's a B, we don't want to rely too much to have like sensitivity over what is the exact value of threshold here and the exact value of the threshold between B and C. In order to reduce those sensitivities, instead of actually, you know, hard code that as A or B or a C, we create the probability of being A and B and C. And we use that to create um, a, a tree. And we look at the words, the sequence of symbols that are uh, more likely to happen. And, and we spread this tree as long as we have a certain amount of you know, minimum value of frequency of these words. Once we have these words and their probabilities, then we create a transition, uh, probabilistic transition uh, among these states, going from like A to AB, from AB to, um, uh, to ABA or something like that. We create a finite automata, but uh, probabilistic finite automata based on these values. And this becomes the mother. In this mother, we don't care what is R, we don't care what is T, we don't care whether T is even there or not. We just you know, look at the range of the values that we're dealing with. When it comes to prediction, we use uh, a window of time. Look at the start with the first row. We look at a uh, observation window uh, for the signal. So for example, we monitor the signal for half a minute, for five minutes, whatever. And then based on the value that we observe here, we make a prediction of the event that is happening in the future. We put a prediction gap between them. So for example, we, we look at the values that we recorded for the last two minutes and make a prediction for four and a half minutes in, in the future, right? And we change with the values of signal window, the window of observation and prediction gap. Sometimes we get, we get the sync, uh, signal window the same, but we increase the uh, prediction gap. We want to make a prediction for well ahead of time. And sometimes we keep the prediction gap as, is, as it is, but we monitor the signal for longer time. And we want to see all these models, how they relate to each other. So next, I'm going to show you the comparison of our results in making these, these, these predictions compared to some conventional methods. So let me show you what we have here. The blue line is our algorithm. The red line is deep learning. The green one is a combination of HRV features and support vector machine. And the yellow one is DWT and, and support vector machine. So we're looking at two of the conventional methods, one deep learning and our method. And the halo that you see around each line is talking about, you know, uh, standard deviation over that. So the vertical lines are AUC area under the curve. Horizontal line is how many minutes ahead of time we make the prediction. Half a minute before before the event, one minute before the event, all the way to four and a half minutes. So each one of these is like, you know, for half a minute observation, one minute observation, and two minute observation. But observation for events that are happening in like in a minute, in a two minutes, in three minutes, or four minutes. As you can see here, our method is essentially better than any of the other methods. The blue one is our method. Deep learning for AFib is very close to ours, but look at the halo, the red halo. The red halo is significantly larger than the blue halo, which you hardly see that, which means that the standard deviation of uh, the results that you get from deep learning are much bigger than the standard deviation that you get from our method, saying that our method, even if you have a lot, a lot of data and you train a reliable deep learning, our method is more robust and it, the ups and downs are far less, regardless of whether you're doing the prediction using a half a minute or, 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 or longer than that. Another observation is that 
no matter how long the, the prediction is, how much, how big the prediction gap is, you're still around 0.8 AUC, which is uh, significant. You can predict what is about to happen with 0.8 um, um, uh, AUC. But now if you look at SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, you will see that you know, now deep learning is far less uh, accurate than ours. In all three cases, you see deep learning is, is significantly lower than our method, the blue one. Red one is deep learning, blue one is ours. And look at the halo around deep learning and other methods that are significant. They're, they're not as robust. So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to do an algorithm that is when you have a lot of data, it's very robust. But if you have few data like SVT that doesn't have a lot of data, you can still have a reliable model and, and it's robust and repeatable. So another uh, challenge that we wanted to talk about is, was uh, incorporating the uncertainty of the labels and utilizing the timing of the data. For that, I'm going to talk about an approach that we are using for uh, prediction of acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. When you look at ARDS, there are two major challenges in, in making detection of ARDS, which is like a very you know, major respiratory issue for, for uh, all ages. One is that nobody really knows what ARDS is. So if you get uh, clinicians to label ARDS, and when ARDS happened, you get significantly different results. So no matter how you create these labels, these labels are uncertain. Secondly is the timeline of how the decision is made. The majority of the time, the clinicians are looking at the patient physiological and you know, EHR data. They look at you know, um, some uh, physiological uh, things such as uh, uh, vital signs and some EHR data such as lab results. And they have to make a decision whether this is ARDS or not. But in reality, uh, um, maybe perhaps two days or whatever days after that, they will order chest uh, X-ray. And chest X-ray is the most informative data that they can have. Having chest X-ray, it would be much easier to say whether they're dealing with ARDS uh, or not. But in reality, at the time that the patient is, is admitted to the hospital, nobody even ordered chest X-ray. Uh, they may not even think of ARDS to order chest X-ray. So chest X-ray, you cannot assume that it's available at the time that they want to make a decision. So if you give this problem to uh, to regular machine learning. Regular machine learning would always want to get, you know, physiological clinical data as an X, the input X, and ARDS, no ARDS as Y. And machine learning, regular machine learning wants to develop a function F that maps X to Y, input to output. And as you see, chest X-ray is nowhere in the picture. In other words, since you don't have chest X-ray when you're making this decision, chest X-ray has absolutely no impact on how F was generated because you need to have like you know um, uh, the input and the output, and you cannot assume you have chest X-ray. The question we're asking is, can we use a new way of uh, machine learning? Uh, we call it learning, uh, not we call it, others call it learning with privileged information that still tries to do the same thing. It wants to look at the physiology X and map it using a function FP to Y, which is ARDS or not. But remember, pay attention to the fact that in training data, in retrospectively collected data, we have access to X-rays, right? These are the cases that happened last year or something. We, we have like, you know, three days after the first assessment, they did an X-ray, so we have an X-ray. Can we somehow train FP in such a way that the impact of those X-rays in the training data is affecting the choice of FP. Pay attention to the fact that if we can do that, FP can be used operationally in real-time usage, just like F in a sense that the input, the real input to the system is still X, but it's predicting Y for you. But the difference between uh, F and FP is, is shown in this diagram that shows the family of functions. See like the family of functions with, with big F on it. If you use regular machine learning, regular machine learning is trained without the knowledge of X-ray and it gives you F. But if you use 
privileged learning, it gives you the knowledge of X star, which pushes the choice from F to FP, which is you know the difference between a naive predictor and a more informed predictor that is FP. So now putting everything together, we design an algorithm that is essentially uh, considers the availability of privilege information, not only just the input and the output, but privilege information and the level of uncertainty over the data, over the labels. I'm not going to go over the algorithm, but this is the revision of SVM, support vector machines, under the, this uh, learning method that we call it uh, learning using label uncertainty and partially available privilege information called Lulu Puppy. We, we decided to put like a funny name for it. Maybe that would attract you know, some more uh, uh, researchers to that. So with Lulu Puppy, if you look at how Lulu Puppy compares, the results of Lulu Puppy compares to conventional techniques, as well as you know, the shallow neural networks and LSTM as, as deep learning approach, you will see that in terms of the level of AUC and the closeness the, between training and testing AUC, we are beating essentially every other technique. So there, sometimes you can have like 9% difference between uh, training and testing between, like, you know, uh, in LSTM cases, but the training, the, the difference between training and testing AUCs are really insignificant. In this case, we're actually getting a slightly higher uh, 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 AUC for, for our method, which is what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a robust technique that uses all the information in there and considers the temporal, you know, relationship between the data. Last one that I'm going to quickly talk about is uh, addressing the issue that I said, like, you know, how to somehow keep the structure of the data using tensor methods. And for that, we are uh, going to talk about an example that is funded by uh, Department of Defense, and that's uh, um, development of uh, algorithms and monitoring systems to uh, essentially predict post-cardiac the events in, in, in patients uh, recovering from uh, major cardiac surgeries. So the question is, first question is how to define these major cardiac events. We spent a year and a half almost uh, putting a panel of different clinicians from different backgrounds to come up with the definition of what is an event. And we came up with the event. We quantified each one of them. That took a significant amount of time to come up with, but it's all worth it. Then we design an algorithm that looks at physiological signals, electrocardiogram, uh, art, uh, arterial blood pressure, and SpO2, and uh, using some estimation method called uh, Tata string, we'll create multiple resolution estimation of the method. And for each of these estimations, we'll calculate a bunch of features. Then we use tensor uh, methods to compress this information combine it with EHR data, and use machine learning for prediction. In order to better explain what happens with tensorization, how we create these tensors, we get the signal. We divide that signal into some windows. For each of the windows, based on multiple resolution that we put on, on, on thought string, we create uh, approximation at different levels, and we create like a set of features, and it could be multiple sets of features. Like this set of features could be wavelet, then we do another thing with a different type of you know, uh, method like Fourier. In reality, in, in terms of algorithmic representation of what is happening, a schematic representation of what is happening is that we create multiple sets of features. And these sets of features, some of them are very, very long. You have many features in, 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 that, in these tensors. What we do, we use higher order singular value decomposition to reduce them in terms of those long uh, dimension, put them in, in all of these tensors in the same or similar uh, um, size. Then we put them on top of each other to form a fourth order tensor for each patient. I cannot show fourth order uh, tensor, so I decided to use a cube, but in your, in your mind, please add another dimension to that to make it a four dimensional cube. So that becomes one patient, and we have so many other patients. Each one of them is represented as a four-dimensional cube. Then we do tensor decomposition. We put all of that to reduce that and get the features, and then we feed that to machine learning algorithm. 
with this algorithm, we want to make a prediction whether the event is happening in half an hour, uh, in one hour, in two hours, in four hours, in eight hours, and 12 hours ahead of time. So we wanted to have a technique, multiple models, that each one of them will tell you about the short-term and long-term event uh, uh, outcome of uh, whether there is an event or not. And I can quickly show the, your results that, you know, uh, our technique that is using some machine learning algorithm developed in, in our lab shows that in half an hour prediction, one hour ahead prediction, all the way to 12 hour prediction, we are in the range of 0.8 uh, AUC, which means that you can predict the results 12 hours ahead of time, predict if some event is about to happen 12 hours ahead of time with very high AUC, and if you look at F1 values, they're also very high, which means the power of adding all the data in the structure and keeping the structure while you're reducing the dimensionality is extremely important. So those are the uh, items that I wanted to cover in, in, in my presentation. So I guess that we have some time for questions, and, and if you want to use the chat button. I guess if you if you add uh, your uh, question or comment in the chat box, we should I should be able to read it, I'm guessing. So I'll wait a few minutes to see if there are questions coming. So I'm I'm not sure if uh, if the system is is uh, allowing for for people to post their their questions via the chat. So um, oh, I started seeing some some things that people are posting. Let me see if I can if I can see that. Uh, maybe not. Uh, so, um, it's in that case, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you email your question to me, and I will try to answer them uh, via email. So, thank you for your time, uh, and uh, 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 I look forward to interacting with you about potential questions that you have. Have a nice day.